of bioimpedance uh, has been studied since at least the mid 1990s. And it was thought to be a pretty promising tool for assessment of volume status. Uh, B BIA for short, uh, uses the electrical properties of the human body to uh, alternate current flow and measures resistance values to estimate body water content and composition. We can't see your slides. Yeah, we can't see your slides. Yeah. Uh, let's see. How's that? Perfect. All right. So uh, <clears throat> this is just a schematic. It's uh, basically an electrical current can flow through tissue at low and high frequencies. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. So if, if we imagine our body as a piece of wire and we connect two ends of the body to form a closed circuit and apply an electrical current, uh, at a specific frequency, we can measure the voltage across that tissue. And by Ohm's law, we can get a tissue resistance by a simple calculation. And the total sum of the resistances <clears throat> across the entire tissue compartment that the current flows through is called bioimpedance. An electrical current can flow through tissue at low and high frequencies. At low frequency, the current does not pass through cells. So the current flows only through the extracellular, uh, flu uh, through the extracellular fluid. However, at high frequency, current is able to flow through both the cell, the cell membrane and tissue fluid. So when using a high frequency current, <clears throat> we can estimate the total body water if we know a person's height and assume a certain body composition. Now at a high frequency, a current freely flows through the intracellular and extracellular compartments. So the total resistance measured is in proportion to the total body water of the entire tissue. And at low frequency, however, when the current cannot flow through cells, the total resistance measured can be an estimate of the body composition just in the extracellular space. Now, a dry weight can be estimated by measuring the volume overload of the patient through the extracellular water to total body water ratio. And in a study done in Korea on some 6,000 plus healthy subjects, they had determined that an ECW to TBW ratio of greater than 0.4 indicated a state of fluid overload. Now, in a systematic review of cohort studies in which multivariable survival models were uh, reported. Uh, 32 out of 38 studies found that overhydration determined by bioimpedance was associated with a worse survival independently of other known predictors such as age, comorbidity, and serum albumin. So it seems promising, right? Um, but as we all know, Association is not causality. And there has not been any RCT that directly proved that a bioimpedance guided management uh, <clears throat> results in any uh, in an improved or less overhydrated fluid status. And there is also a risk of dehydration and risk of harming residual kidney function preservation particularly in the PD population, if we're over-dialyzing patients with a bioimpedance-guided management approach. Now, this leads to our study. <clears throat> the authors of this paper uh, con conducted a RCT that shows all-cause mortality as the primary outcome to see if it is at least safe to use this as, uh, use this as a viable fluid management approach. It is a prospective randomized control trial aimed to investigate the outcome of BIA devices on the clinical assessment and management of hydration status in patients on PD. <clears throat> it is the RCT. Uh, it is a uh, open labeled, meaning the investigators were not blinded 
to which treatment arm the patient was randomized to. And also it had a follow-up uh, of one year, which later was extended to three years. And uh, we'll discuss what kind of problems this may bring up. And this was done just at a single center in uh, a southern, uh, a metropolitan city in Southern China. <clears throat> The uh, study included all prevalent and stable adult patients from July 1st, 2013 to March 30th, 2014. Uh, all patients who had a continuous ambulatory PD for at least three months. They, uh, the exclusion criteria were contraindications to BIA measurements, for example, amputation, presence of a pacemaker or prosthesis, or inability to stand steadily for three minutes, concomitant dialysis modalities, PD plus HD, severe heart failure, uh, NYHA class four symptoms, uh, acute, uh, acute complications, uh, severe malnutrition, malignant tumor, or pregnancy. And uh, participants uh, recorded were randomly assigned in a one-to-one -one ratio to the BIA group or the fluid management guided by, by bioimpedance plus traditional clinical methods or the control group. Uh, and uh, simple randomization was performed without using any stratification. And physicians and investigators in the trial were blinded to randomization. So, the primary endpoint was all-cause mortality. And uh, the secondary endpoints were cardiovascular disease, mortality, and technique survival. CVD included ischemic heart disease, stroke, and peripheral artery disease. And technique, uh, technique failure was defined as a situation where a patient switched uh, from PD to HD for greater than three months. Now, patients in the control arm had their traditional clinical assessments per the center's usual measures, including body weight, blood pressure, edema, signs and symptoms of heart failure or hypovolemia. And patients in the interventional arm had their volume status assessed with traditional clinical measures plus bioimpedance uh, assessment. And uh, BIA participants underwent a serial body composition measurements during every visit, whereas controls were measured only at enrollment and at study completion. And regardless of the group, uh, those who were diagnosed with volume overload were required to follow their water, uh, water restriction protocol and return within a month, whereas those with uvolemia were, were uh, inst instructed to uh, just to return every three months. And if a patient was deemed volume overloaded and if they had residual urine uh, volume of at least 200 cc per day, diuretics were used first before increasing the dialysate concentration. And there was no automated PD or icodextrin use in either of the cohorts. And uh, the estimated sample size was 240 to provide the trial with a 90% power to detect an absolute difference of uh, at least 10% in all cause mortality uh, at one year follow up. And uh, they had an estimated baseline mortality of 85% and at an alpha level of 0.05. And this calculation would allow for withdrawal rate and follow-up loss of 10%. Any questions so far? Anyone know what, uh, what alpha lo of level of 0 0.05 means? Yeah, yeah, it's related. Yeah, basically related to the PL value. It's basically, uh, it, it, alpha of 0 0.05 basically implies that the, the no hypothesis is rejected 5% of the time when it is in fact true. So basically you're making an error saying that uh, uh, there is a difference, uh, although there is not a true difference. And the chance of that happening is 5%. 
and uh, they allow for a withdrawal rate of up to 10%. And they use Kaplan-Meier method to uh, measure uh, survival and mortality. And uh, they also calculated a, uh, a linear growth model for each patient uh, for the rate of ECW to TBW uh, ratio decline. Now let's first look at the result of their enrollment. I'm sorry for. Can I interrupt for a moment? This is Rachel. Yeah. I just have a, a quick question. Um, so um, how much did the patients know about the results of this, um, of these additional measurements that were done? I mean, the patients usually know their weight and follow their weight. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you mean I, yeah, and they're often quite um, in, engaged in that, <laughs> and they have opinions about what's going on and what the weight is, and if it changed, why it changed, and what we should do about it. And I just am curious. I don't think I've I've looked through the article, and I don't see that the bioimpedance was something that was blind. You know, I don't think the patients were blinded to it, but I just don't see the uh, sense of how much patient involvement there was in learning these measurements and, and knowing what they were. Yeah, Dr. Fizel, that, that's a great question. I don't think the, the authors clarified that in the paper, like you said. I couldn't find it either. Okay, thank yeah, you. But I, I would imagine, to... I would imagine it's probably based on each individual center, you know, how how engaged they are with their with each patient and their practice patterns may be very different, you know, in China versus how we do things here. I agree. They're but, but, but Rachel's absolutely right. I mean, they, they could have blinded this. You, you, you can have a, a, a sham bioimpedance. There's nothing to it. It's just some, uh, some straps around your, what, your wrist and your ankles or something like that. There's no shock or anything like that. So they really could have done a sham bioimpedance and truly blinded it. Right. Yeah. If, uh, yeah. You, there, there are, yeah, that's, that's totally right. There are actually other, I feel like there are bigger problems with this study than that, but uh, yeah, you, you're right, Dr. Gopher. So um, let, let, let's uh, very quickly look over the result of the enrollment. So they started with 280 patients who were eligible and uh, 40 of them were excluded and half of them was randomized to the interventional arm and the other half to the control arm. And at the end of one year, uh, which was the follow-up period at their initial protocol, the authors decided to extend the follow-up period to three years. Now, a question to the audience, what kind of problems can you encounter when you decide to extend the follow-up period from one to three years? And I should clarify, so they, they studied uh, all the subjects until uh, the one year mark. And then they actually, they looked at the study results and then they made the decision to continue for another two years. What do you think? What kind of problems can you encounter with that approach? We'll have to do repeated analysis, right? So that will... Right, yes, they did. Or lots to follow up. Or... Lots to follow up. Yeah, the, uh, the dropout rate uh, after after three years, you know, twelve uh, looks like twenty two versus ten. Yeah. Yeah, I am concerned about uh, exactly as Steve Corbett said that you potentially bias the study, and more specifically that um, the particular. I mean, there are a lot of ways you could bias the study, but the um, the the transfer to HD, the PD dropout wasn't equal in each arm. And mm -hmm. um, then the transfer to, so first of all, one of the reasons we do it is because people aren't doing a good job with their fluids. <laughs> so that's a potential source of bias, but, um, but without, you know, that's a potential thing where an investigator knowing the results of the study, even just subconsciously could make a clinical decision to leave somebody in or take them out that could be a potential, uh, that could potentially change, um, you know, cardiovascular disease. I mean, technique survival is one of the outcomes, right? Yeah. So that's a specific variable that I'm concerned about potential for bias. 
that an investigator is involved with. I mean, it's a clinical decision. And I looked in the article and I couldn't really see the specific reasons for um, technique failure. Um, maybe I missed it, so. Uh, yeah, they. I don't think they, <laughs> yeah, Dr. Fasal, you read the paper, you know, very, very thoroughly. Yeah, they did not mention that. Um, I just want to expand on Steve Corbett's comment and say, I agree with him. And that is one of my specific concerns. Yeah, yeah. So obviously the 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 study the the authors thought the studies were uh, was underpowered by the end of the one year, uh, and by extending the follow up period, the authors were hoping to capture more events to yield a statistically uh, significant result. Um, but uh, like what Dr. Fassell has said, um, doing taking this approach, uh, there is more chances of introducing bias. Uh, just in terms of management differences, what if uh, the physicians looked at the results after one year and they decided to manage patients differently? Um, there's no way to, to capture that or, or, or stratify that. Um, now let's uh, look at the result of the randomization. Uh, this is a busy slide, but I've highlighted some of the, the uh, high yield points that I thought were important. The control group had worse residual urine volume of 200 cc per day versus 300 cc per day in the interventional arm. Uh, and the control arm also had a higher proportion of patients with high or high average transport status. Now, another question to the audience, why might this be a problem in analyzing the results? Maybe one of the first years. So basically the ones who are in the control group are maybe more sick patients as compared to the ones. Yeah, the absolutely. Body. Absolutely. Yeah, so the, the, uh, the control group, so both, both residual urine volume and, and uh, high or high average transport status are negative uh, prognostic factors for uh, mortality and uh, and someone trying to write on here <laughs> and uh, and a technique failure as well um, but part of the part of the rationale for that may be uh, inflammation just so you they're, they're, with the exception of, of the Karolinska group, um, most other investigators have, have shown the association between a higher, higher in, inherent transport status, not acquired, but a higher inherent transport status, and say the presence of some inflammatory cytokines. The, the one group that has not been able to corroborate that is uh, uh, in Sweden, but it goes to the point where one, one of you said about they might be more ill and uh, the, the association of inflammation, higher transport status, and, and then concurrent illness. Right, right. Yeah, so basically these are uh, more room for introducing uh, uh, confounding factors. And... Uh, but what's good to note is that the, uh, the both groups did have comparable serum albumin and pre-albumin levels, which uh, indicates that they have similar nutritional status. Now let's uh, look at the, uh, well, uh, so let me explain this real quick. So after one year, 55% uh, in the PIA group and 35% in the control group achieved about the a uh, fluid control target of uh, less than uh, 0.4 of the ECW to TBW uh, ratio less than 0.4. And uh, this data is important because it showed that the study intervention achieved a good separation from the control arm. This means that whether the no hypothesis is rejected or not, the results are meaningful. So now let's look at the primary outcome, which is all-cause mortality. The overall patient survival after one year was not statistically different between BIA guided management group and the control group. 
Now, you might ask, why is the cumulative mortality only 5% uh, when the estimated mortality in the PD population is estimated at around 15%? This may affect the generalizability of the study if the study population does not uh, reflect the general PD uh, population. I actually don't know what our PD uh, uh, mortality is here. Um, but for the attendings here, would anyone be okay with sharing what your institution's PD mortality is for comparison? Ours is the national average because our it's called a, uh, correct me, uh, 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 folks, but it, it's something ratio. And we get the report on that monthly. And uh, Mega, you know what it is, uh, what, what that thing that we, uh, that Derek does, but ours is, uh, it, it's not better than the national average. It is the national average. Am I sort of correct, Mega? Yes, that's right. And let me just say- I don't say, know the exact person. Yeah, I don't remember the number, but, it, but it's, uh, and we have a kind of a robust uh, palliative dialysis. Uh, and in fact, that is a little bit contrary to what is done in China. Uh, we'll come back to that, but but we have we have a uh, a kind of take all policy in our unit. So the fact that we've got a mortality rate that's equal to the national average, if other people in the U.S. are cherry picking, then in fact we're doing a, a good job. Right, right, yeah. So 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 uh, I have another comment, uh, Rachel here. Um, so, so in this one year follow up, and I'm sure they must have reported this and I just can't find it. I'm not finding incidents of peritonitis, or, or they just didn't have any in either group, because that can affect your fluid balance, right? Was that here? And I missed it? The catheter related infection. Okay. All right. So I'm uh, one year primary and secondary outcomes, uh, catheter related infection, N equals two in the control group. So the control group had two and they lumped catheter related infection and pulmonary infection together. That seems, well, it's only one year follow-up. So um, I think usually it's not unreasonable to expect one episode of peritonitis every kind of two years. So perhaps that's not too low, but still it just seems very, seems very low. I don't know. What do other colleagues think about that? Well, I don't know why they don't, aren't, aren't uh, giving us that. The, the term I wanted and I couldn't think of was standardized mortality rate, SMR, and that that's done uh, uh, it's done automatically because we have to turn in mortality. And uh, so that SMR is calculated monthly. And that takes into account your case mix, right? At your center. That's how they're standardizing based on your case mix. I, I yes. Yes. You're right, Rachel. You would know what all that case mix is. It's, I, I don't know the variables. We've had it for so long. I don't, don't remember right. anymore. Yeah. That's why they, when they say standardized, that's what they mean. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sell and uh, Dr. Gopher. Um, so just to finish my earlier thought, so uh, the one year mortality of only 5% may be an indication that like what Dr. Gopher was hinting at, that maybe they were cherry picking their patients and uh, it again affects the generalizability of the study. Um, but when the study was extended to three years, they were able to capture a statistically significant difference in mortality uh, with 13 in the bioimpedance group and 31 in the control group. Now let's look at the secondary outcomes. For uh, cardiovascular mortality, uh, it was analyzed by Captain Meyer method. Uh, it also showed that there was no statistical difference between the two groups. But when the study period was extended, the cumulative CVD three-year mortality was significantly lower in the BIA group than in the control group. And we looked at uh, technique survival. Again, there was no significant difference between the two cohorts after one year, but after three years, 29 in the control group had switched to HD 
versus 17 in the interventional group. And yeah, that's my major concern. And do we know why? Do we know the reasons for that switch? Did they tell us why they switched to eight? Right, yeah, that's a, that's a great don't. question. Yeah, we don't know, okay. Sorry to interrupt, thank you. No, not at all. The other thing that we don't know with the three-year follow-up, I'm not sure that we know this, perhaps we do and I need to do a closer read is things like changes in, um, in uh, residual renal function, which we know that every drop of urine is gold, survival gold. It, every drop of urine keeps you alive if you're still making it. And after three years, um, there may be differences. Uh, the vintage was about the same heading into the study. So, so I don't, I'm not concerned about vintage being a source of bias, but I, I would be curious to know, um, to know residual renal function. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. That was uh, yeah. one of the, one of the uh, risks that people thought about, about impedance guided fluid management is actually uh, dehydration. Um, are, are we uh, over dialyzing patients to a point where it's affecting their residual renal function? Um, there, this study did not look at that. So uh, just to summarize the study in the author's own words, our results from a one-year cohort study demonstrate that uh, BIA-guided fluid management was uh, more effective to achieve fluid balance than traditional clinical methods alone. Um, but there was no difference in the outcomes in terms of patient survival, technique survival, and CVD mortality. However, a larger study with a longer follow-up period is warranted to confirm our results. So question to the audience, what do you think the strengths and the limitations of the study are? We kind of already named a few earlier. Like you alluded to, the mortality rate was low. Mm -hmm. So the conclusion was, well, we would have to follow for a long period of time. So I think, it, I mean, obviously mortality is a very important outcome and CBD is a important outcome. But I think it would have been cool and maybe more reasonable within a year to look at something like hospitalization for heart failure or volume overload events or something like that. And then they might have had a higher event rate we could have had a more solid conclusion because if only 5% of people die during your predefined outcome and you don't have power to right. look at it, then what can we even take from the study? Right. I do have to say, though, when they extended the, the three year to, to the three years, it was an attempt to, uh, to strengthen the study. So even though it's still flawed, uh, but I think it was a... It was a, a, a a good approach to, to kind of strengthen their results. It would have been a better approach if they hadn't broken, uh, <laughs> they hadn't stopped at one year and, uh, and learned what the results were and then decided to keep going. I'm, right. Uh, that would yeah, it would have been better if they did not look at the <laughs> results at all and it just kept going. They said, we're going to do three years. Although I get why they did that. Like I understand. <laughs> or, or they could have had somebody else do it make sure, you know, that could have been done by a, a study committee, not let them know about it, say, yes, this is safe and uh, you should continue to accrue patients. Um, so make sure the safety was fine, yeah. I, I, Anna, are you still with us? Uh, I think, uh, and the reason I'm asking is in, in some of the finerenone studies- Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. In some of the finerenone studies, uh, they look at uh, drug utilization and how much of other drugs are utilized. Are there some methodologies that they could have looked at uh, uh, assessing blood pressure control? Because blood pressure is a number, and then uh, how you achieve that control is volume plus drugs. And I'm wondering if you've got any suggestions of how one might measure uh, medication use in a study like this. Right. Uh, I think I understand what you're asking, what you're getting at. I mean, you could look at total number of medications prescribed, um, uh, like total number of antihypertensive medications prescribed. Um, what? Yeah, I, I think the, 
you know, in most studies, they'll record all the meds. The really challenging thing that I don't think anyone has done well is dosage change. So you can look at someone's on two meds or three meds, but say they're in a study for whatever, six months or a year or whatever, there could be numerous dosage changes and kind of figuring out how to communicate that. I, I don't know, Anna, I haven't seen a good, good way to do it. It's very no, labor intensive. And, and, and that is precisely why I asked you who have, uh, Julie, I didn't see you on the study. I would have asked you because you guys have done so many. No, no, we're both, hey, Anna's more current than I am. I mean, I'm, you know, I don't do the trials anymore. I just go to the FDA. So, and, but and I what, haven't seen anything that works. And, and, it's really and, complicated. And, and, well, I, yeah, that's why I ask you. I didn't know how to do it, but but what I do know how to do is uh, uh, measure what solutions are used uh, in the, in the PD, and uh, I didn't really see that report. There there were some restrictions. You said no icodextrin use, and I think I forget the other restriction. But you can actually uh, at, precisely measure what solutions these people use. Uh, that's item one, and two, you can control uh, report the blood pressure. And um, so I, I think I would like to know those things. So for the fellows that have come through the home unit, what do you think about the generalizability to our population with the prescriptions that they were using? Good question. <laughs> So they only they only used uh, manual PDs and uh, they did not use any icodextrin. Is that what we're seeing here for our home patients? Everyone's shaking their heads here, Dr. Salani. We we use about uh, about ninety percent of the PD patients are on the cycler. And uh, we use icodextrin fairly liberally. I can't take Omega, do we know what fraction of our patients are on ICO? I would guess 50 or 60%, something like that. I think every month it's been and higher and higher. We're using it a lot more over the <laughs> recent. And what would you think about the difference in the transport status and control arm versus the biopedic arm for somebody that's on manual. Yeah. Is it cheaper than it used to be? Um, it's, yeah, it's covered a lot more easily now than it used to be. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's sort of like- They a actually want of... us to use it now. So it's, <laughs> they didn't put any barriers up anymore. That's a principle of capitalism, right? That like, if something gets wider spread use, the price goes down. <laughs> right. And yeah, Dr. Salani, I think the answer to your question was, uh, uh, yeah, the patients with higher uh, transport status, they require more frequent exchanges to achieve the same, same amount of uh, uh, ultra filtration. Uh, actually, in this study, they did mention that for all their manual patients, uh, they were able to do uh, more exchanges at home by themselves to give them that higher UF, even though that's not what we're really what we're doing here. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on. So we have time to finish up. Another big difference that, that I do see here is their BMI, uh, which is quite low like up to 22s while in US and in North America yeah. is pretty higher. So yes, that's quite a remarkable difference between that their population and here. Yes, absolutely. I guess what I'm not getting is where the gap is. Like what is the need for bioimpedance? Um, I feel like the, the, we have a, a scale that they step on when they come to clinic, the patients have scales at home. And um, I, I can usually have a sense if the patient is volume overloaded, um, I may not be able to manage it as well as I would like, but it's usually not a mystery to me or to the nurse or to the patient. I would be curious to know what gap this is, this is filling. And one answer could be what my colleague just brought up about BMI, right? Perhaps the assessment of volume is more difficult with a higher BMI 
and we might get significance in our outcomes at one year if we did it in the US where BMIs are higher and it's harder to assess volume status. Yeah, actually there has not been any direct study that uh, proved that uh, bowel impedance uh, correlates uh, well with uh, somebody's volume status or their right heart pressures. Um, it's been difficult to prove because bowel impedance, you're looking at a uh, extra vascular uh, volume. Um, but uh, a lot of times when we talk about volume status, what matters is the fluid that's actually in our blood vessels and generating our pressures mm -hmm. uh, and giving us a lot of the symptoms. Um, I agree with you, Dr. Fissel, what you're bringing it up, that gap, because if person is seen by consistently one physician, we see them every month or every other month. Just looking at patient, we can tell like how the volume status looking, looking at their UF pattern, their blood pressure pattern. And there was similar study in hemodialysis patient, the NUST trial, MUST. There, they were using ultrasonogram, not the bioimpedance, but sonogram looking at the curly A line, B line. And based on those lines, they were determining their UF goals and they followed the patients for one year. Yes, they, there were some changes in the dry weight or something, but overall there was no difference in the outcome in the randomized intervention arm versus control arm. So this is the same pattern we are seeing again and again. We I agree that our volume assessment are not the best. We need these other measures, but these measures are not doing any better than our regular assessments, what we are doing on daily basis. And, uh, but I agree that I would still say that most of our patients end up being volume overloaded eventually and they have bad outcome. Um, in all these studies, nobody talks about the sodium intake on daily basis these patients deal with. We're always talking about what's the UF. Like I'm looking at this, um, I'm sorry, I joined a little late. Um, their urine output is only 200, 250 cc and they have eight liters of therapy manual. They not, they're not, their UF volume is about 400, 500. So how, like, it's overall less than one liter of output and you add a little bit of insensible. So you're talking about 1.2, 1.3 liters of daily output. In US, how many people maintaining with 1.2, 1.3 liters per day? Um, so yes, problem is the generalizability. And then as you're talking, what is the gap we are filling in here? We are not seeing any outcome improvement with these studies. Or at least this one, the, the outcomes may be confounded by other factors. Well, so just to wrap things up, the, the, str the strings that I have identified were, uh, it is a RCT and it did assess mortality as a primary outcome, uh, which is difficult to do. Uh, and it did have a pretty low dropout rate uh, in the first year. And uh, it's the, they extended the study period to three years to better assess uh, their outcomes, which uh, was a, a good attempt uh, to strengthen the study results. Um, mm -hmm. But regardless, uh, the study was uh, underpowered uh, and uh, there were confounders that existed. Uh, for example, the high peritoneal uh, transport status and the lower res residual kidney function in the control group. Both are indicators of worse mortality and technique failure. And the ECW to uh, TBW ratio of greater than 0.4 as a cutoff for to define overhydration may not be an appropriate uh, volume overload uh, cutoff for the PD population because it was determined by uh, you, you know you know you know healthy population, uh, not specific to the PD population. And lastly, the generalizability of the study. It was done at a single center and they did not have any APD or icodextrin use. And here's a graphical summary of the paper. So uh, just, to, uh, just to wrap things up, I, I think in conclusion, uh, volume status evaluation is a, I think we all agree here that it is a complex clinical assessment and bioimpedance uh, remains viable as a potential useful adjunct to clinical assessment to guide better therapy, even though it, it, uh, it is not the definitive uh, standard to determine uh, volume status. 
So uh, I want to zone in on something that Dr. Fassell said. Uh, she uh, she did it in the context of so many of her patients are volume overloaded, and uh, I I tend to know it. So does my staff, and my problem is what to do about it. I think that is just to what you said. She's smiling, so I can see that. Uh, Andrew Davenport uh, in uh, 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 the UK University College London has actually done a similar study uh, as this one in his unit. And uh, in his population, uh, there's a, a quite a bit of discipline. And when they identify the patients that are subtly volume overloaded, meaning volume overloaded, not appreciated by the physician, uh, they were able to affect some change. Now, they, they, this was intentional and they did it with various solutions and they did it with discussing with the patients. Uh, so I think it really does depend on, on the uh, population, which le goes to your gen generalization. Uh, I, I challenge uh, Dr. Bonsall in San Antonio, Dr. Fassell in Nashville to uh, limit the sodium intake of their patients. I, I want you to show me how you do that. Uh, so the reality is, uh, these uh, try as we will, these patients are at home, we're seeing them once a month, and they're gonna, uh, we have liberalized their diet, we've liberalized it because we want them to increase their protein intake, and we want them to have a lifestyle of being at home. So home patients in the United States, particularly in the Southern part of the United States, are going to get into salt, and as a consequence, be, have a little more volume issues. And so the question I think, I think all our energy needs to go to what we do about it not the recognition. It goes to what Dr. Fussell said. It's, it's not that hard to recognize it because 75% or higher of our patients are volume overloaded. And then the question is, what are you going to do about it? The, the one thing I would add, um, Dr. Golper, is that I was, this is sort of what I was thinking about in the beginning when I asked um, whether the patients knew the results of the measurements, because there, there is a group of patients and particularly sometimes their partners that are helping them with PD, which was not reported in this patient, right? If there was a partner that was making the meals and, and making sure the medicines were taken, that has a huge effect on how well a patient does. Um, that, that in response to the data can change what they're doing. And um, what, I, what I would be interested in is whether having the patients know the information could potentially change their behavior or their sodium intake. And I would also be curious, and this is, this is, you know, this is just in a perfect world, could we put the bioimpedance on the cycler, <laughs> right? So the patient could get that number in addition to their weight. That's, and then, cause sometimes people change in response to data. And maybe they maybe that would be something that would help people eat less salt or or drink less fluid. I, I do think a future generation of hemo machines are going to do that. And and uh, the people who are going to make the changes are going to be the technicians doing the thrice weekly dialysis. Uh, but uh, I don't think that's going to happen with home patients. And, and my experience has been that, Rachel, should you show them, should you actually show them the bioimpedance data that suggests that they're volume overloaded, that whatever behavioral change you do will last only a few months, and then patients will revert back to uh, their behavior. I would say that um, showing different kind of data, like not BIA, but just in general, that when your weight was this, your blood pressure was high, you were talking, taking two medicines, your pressure was still not controlled. And now you see your weight is 10 pounds down, your pressures are beautifully controlled and you're not on any medicine. And then they go revert back and then weight again up, weight of blood pressure again up. So they see in front of their eyes that how their weight and blood pressures are changing. So this is this is also important data and i'm not saying everybody changes but i i would have few patients definitely change their behavior their diet their way they are cooking at home and they've been successful and i have shown some of the patients even having reversal of their lvh improvement of their ejection fraction improvement of their pulmonary pressures because they get periodic echo for their transplant workup or transplant maintenance and then i show them look at your lvh 
I showed that like that was first saying severely concentric LV hypertrophy, and now it says like there is no hypertrophy. So there are success results. It's not, I'm not saying it's widespread, but all these data points help. Great. Thank you, everybody.